Okay. All right, are we live? Yep. All right. I'm Kent By, and I'm going to be doing an interview with Michael here. All right, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell me a bit about what you do in astrology. Yeah, I'm Michael Earlywine, and uh, I've been an astrologer for, into astrology for 58 years. And I was the first astrologer to program, well, actually I program on, on four function calculators and then programmable calculators that were published by uh, Hewlett Packard. And then uh, in 1977, when the home computers came out, I wrote the first astrology programs in AK, uh, one that did all the planets to within two minutes of arc, and also various, you know, geocentric, heliocentric, and stuff like that, and made them available to astrologers in the beginning for free. And I spent all my days copying tapes, because they were on cassette tapes then. And I finally I began charging because my family had to survive and I wasn't do, doing anything else but doing that. So I built Matrix Software, which is next door here, and eventually sold it to one of my uh, co-workers that was working with me. And uh, it, it's the second oldest software company of any kind on the internet that's still going. The only older one is Microsoft. So it's been there since a, a long time. Wow, that's amazing. And yep. so what was your inspiration for, uh, like, were you an astrologer before? And then, and you're obviously, you've been doing it for 58 years. I'm uh, 42 and I was born in 1976. So that was, you know, a, you're already doing it for a good, you know, 17, yeah. 18 years. So maybe you could talk about, like, how you got into astrology to begin with. And then at what turning point did you decide that you were going to use this new computing technology to compute the charts? Okay. I'm a child of the 1950s. And in 1950s, we had things like uh, the Soviet threat and air raid dr drills in the classroom, crawling under tables. And as a kid, it's pretty scary. But worse than that, we had, um, it was a heyday for uh, modern psychology. And so instead of having attributes like uh, kindness and patience, we were labeled with uh, things like schizophrenic and manic depressive and paranoid. So the image I had of myself, I mean, of any means, it wasn't that I had all those, it's just that that was kind of what was going around. So that when, when I came across astrology, which actually described me in a more benign way, uh, instead of being paranoid or problems, and I, I, I liked that. I, I, it was hard to have a self-image in that climate because for me, the psychological jargon was a little crazy. Uh, and it was just prevalent. So, you ask how I got in, that's how I got into it. Astrology had another way of seeing me, a different face, a different persona, you know, with positive attributes. And so, that's how I wandered into it. Hmm. And I think there are more to your question, but what was it? Well, I guess, uh, I, I, to just uh, stay in that time period, I'm wondering, like, who were the teachers or the books, or how did you learn about astrology in that era? Well, again, I'll step backward. <laughs> Uh, I was trained as a naturalist since I was very, very young. And so instead of learning much about how man ruled the world, I learned how Mother Nature ruled the world. So that when I hit the school system, I didn't respond well because my idea of what was real didn't match up with many of the teachers. Unless the teacher was someone that I respected for their life wisdom, I couldn't learn from them very well. So I, for 12 years or so, I never finished high school because I finally just walked out because it's just too boring. Uh, in fact, they, they were worried about me. My parents were worried early on in the, in the school, so they had me tested. And it turns out I wasn't retarded. I was bored. And I was, you know, had a very high IQ, stuff like that. So, but I did what I wanted. So I'm trying to get around to what you're saying. I'm going to blow my nose for a second. You can record it if you want. So, <laughs> so. Okay, so, um, and I forgot the question again. Oh, so uh, how, what kind of information was there uh, mm -hmm. when you were starting and how you got into astrology? Okay, so that's how I got into it. And, um, but I guess I'm responding to your, your talk about uh, I'm trying to think of how I want to approach it. Um, yeah, I, I, let's put it this way. I'm, I'm a self-taught person. You know, uh, I'm what's called a polymath. 
polymath is someone who's an expert in a whole variety of fields. So I'm an expert astrologer because I am. And I'm also very, very trained in Tibetan Buddhist Dharma practice for 40 some years, expert in rock and roll posters, uh, uh, an expert critic in music, and uh, produced the largest music database in the world called the All Music Guide, allmusic.com. There's no larger one, and it has everything from 10 inch records up to the present. I don't own it anymore. Also, did the same thing with movies. I did this, every movie casting characters. Did the same thing for a while with video games, but then I left the I mean, I sold the company and they didn't carry that on. Uh, I'm an expert photographer, well-known photographer nationally for close-up flowers, flower photography, and on and on. I know a lot of different things. All self-taught. That means that I did, I did learn, I never had a grandfather. So first, I very much studied with, I was a musician. So. Back in 1961, I traveled, hitchhiked with Bob Dylan. I played with Jerry Garcia. I opened for Eric Clapton in Cream in, in, in San Francisco at the Fillmore, things like that. But for many years, what I did was study black music, uh, particularly ele black electron electronic music, and helped to put on the first two Ann Arbor Blues Festivals, which was the largest, largest collection of uh, black musicians, blues musicians ever, because they begin to die off very rapidly. They were older, so they could never assemble again. But we had hundreds of them, including their families and all their sidemen. Uh, and it was somewhat of a celebration because they were presenting black music to a white audience for the first time in, in such quantity. But they were also having a celebration of being with one another because there had never been that many of them. Maybe in a club there might be two of them crossing paths or something, but there were hundreds of them, and it was somewhat of a celebration, and it was a, still maybe one of the great highlights of my life. And I, I interviewed them, um, tons of them, and I also interviewed rock and roll people, some, and rock and roll poster people quite thoroughly, you know, scores of them. And so I've done a lot of interviews, and, and astrologers, they have tons and tons and tons of them over the years. So I kind of, I'm an archivist, I'm an award-winning ar archivist, archivist, you know, I received the Yahoo Life Award, which Yahoo is not big anymore, but back then, that was a big thing, with the fly to New York and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, that's some of my background. Hmm. So, but in terms of like learning astrology, how did you, because astrology is a long tradition, I mean, you say you're self-taught, but you have to have some connection to the tra tradition. So what kind of books or like if you had a teacher or like there's a community of astrologers that is propagating this information for thousands of years. So what was your access point into that? Yeah, what you say is probably true, but certainly not true for me in the sense that of all the astrologers I've met and because I founded Matrix Software, we had over 30,000 customers. And so for a time, all of the astrologers, big and small, came through us one way or another. The only astrologer I ever learned anything from that was new was Theodore Lanscheid. Theodore Lanscheid was a Supreme Court Justice of Germany, but he was also an incredible astrologer. And I sent him his first computer back in the, I think, 1978 or something, which he did his, his landmark uh, research. So what I did is teach myself, and I have great friends. Charles A. Jane was my closest friend. It's not that I didn't know all these guys. I just didn't learn from them other than to be a good friend. Uh, I taught myself because I know how to teach myself and because in my Dharma practice, I, I know how to use the mind as a reference source and a resource. Uh, and you don't have to look elsewhere. I don't agree with you that the connection to tradition. There are also people who establish traditions, and I, I feel I'm one of those people. Most of the techniques that I have established, which are used by other people, like local space and stuff like that, came out of my mind. So the mind is a great resource, and so uh, I know how to go into my mind and research there and come up with uh, important principles and then work them into existence and then share them with others. So that's what I did. And I have, you know, Many many techniques that uh, to, to prove it. Well, I guess there's 
whole tradition of science. So in order just to write a, an ephemeris, you had the Babylonians for, you know, hundreds of years recording the, the motion of Venus, and then that eventually started into science, and then in order so, to even so do an ephemeris, there's, there's a whole scientific community. So I think it's a bit of a myth to say that you self-created everything, because you're using equations and other things. So did you completely invent astrology from scratch? No, but you know, you're just backing up far enough to cover your butt. But uh, yeah, I don't agree with that. Of course, I didn't invent language. I didn't invent uh, science or mathematics or uh, programming. I'm trying to say I taught myself uh, mathematics. I taught myself how to program. I taught myself uh, English in a more refined way and so on. What I'm saying is that the ideas in my mind that came out are now proven useful to astrology. They didn't come from anywhere else but from my mind. So it's not like I'm not connected to these people. I am. But mm. I'm connected as friends and as a, my tribe. So I love astrology deeply and I've devoted 58 years of my life to it. So what I'm saying is that we're only talking about astro when it comes to astrology uh, and it's not the I, I had the largest astrology library in the world that I donated to the University of, of Wisconsin a few years ago, thousands and thousands, and I, I didn't read them all, but I certainly knew them all. So it's not that I didn't look at what had been done before me. It's, it's what I'm trying to say is that the techniques that I've developed and shared almost entirely came from within my own mind and are new to astrology. Period. Hmm. So whether you like it or not. <laughs> well, what, what is local space? I haven't heard of local space. Right? I don't know if I use it or not, but what, what, what does it mean? What does local space mean? Local space, are you familiar with astrocartography? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, local space is a, another method, completely different than astrocartography, which looks at meridians and ascendant arcs and stuff, the arc of the ascendant and stuff like that. Local space, which you should know about, um, is looking at the local horizon system in azimuth and altitude uh, so that it'll, if your dad were to pick you up as a kid and walk outside and there was a moon in the sky and we drew a line through the moon, that line would also go through a great circle on the earth itself. And it would also be a great circle through the heavens. So it's a map of the moment of your birth and the same planets but from uh, a coordinate system of azimuth and altitude. There, there are several different coordinate systems, each of which is like an algebra in the sense that it's a way of looking at ourselves. If you know more than one, then you can uh, kind of triangulate and create something like a 3D uh, representation of who you are. Hmm. Right, and um, if we go back to when you first wrote the Matrix software, what was the catalyst or the inspiration to write the first astrology software? Sure, the catalyst was really simple. I had been doing charts with logarithms and ephemerides for years, and there were things that I wanted to do, like local space, that you couldn't do. And I first did them on pencil and paper and, log and uh, trig tables, and then I did them in pocket calculators with trig tables in the calculator. Then I had to write my own programs because I didn't want to spend, it would take me a whole day, whole day to do one local space chart. So then I, I, wrote, I wanted to write software that would do this, to, you know, in the first a few minutes and then now in seconds, almost instantaneously. So I learned programming so that I could do the kind of research that I was doing in my mind and be able to materialize it physically so that others could do it too. Hmm. Well, it seems like that computing has completely revolutionized and to a certain extent democratized astrology. So it sounds like you were on that forefront of well, I was providing the, tools. I was the forefront. I was walking point, period. There's no one else that did it. And then they, there are other, other people who did program, but they did not share it with other people. Hmm. So. And how did that, from your perspective, how did that sort of change the astrology community? Well, instantly and gradually. Um, some people were loath to give up their tables. They thought that the meditation time that took them to look up log tables and stuff was somehow precious. And then a little later when we started to have, uh, to implement uh, programmed readings, there was a whole lot of outcry. Uh, people very upset that 
computers were going to be interpreting. And so, but yet all of the astrologers who were trying to make money would contact us kind of under the table and buy these programs because they couldn't, they had many people that couldn't afford to pay them the fee to sit down with them, but they could pay five or ten dollars for a printed report. And so they wanted, so this, I mean, it soon became habitual. Everyone had it. But there was a time when there's a whole lot of divided opinion as to whether these things were legitimate or worthwhile or well done and, and it, you know all of that kind of stuff if, that, if you can understand that hmm. well, yeah I, I've been uh, uh, writing my own software uh, to track transits and I've had debates with horary astrologers who said um, and I guess this, this comes to the philosophical question is do you, do you think that astrology can get completely reduced down to an algorithm or do you think that there's something about an astrologer that has to help be there with a person and, and uh, be and help to some extent, resolve the different inconsistencies and paradoxes to be able to do a full transmission of the archetypes? Or do you think that it is possible to potentially reduce all of astrology down to an algorithm? Well, the key word there is all of astrology. I mean, no, I don't think you're going to replace the human being totally, but I think that more and more can be done through a computer. It's not like a computer is not using human stuff. We're writing it. We're writing everything in it. We're writing all the interpretations and words in it. So it's just like extending ourselves more widely than not everyone can come and talk to me or any astrologer, but everyone could have probably eventually afford a program. And as they get a hold of AI, intelligence stuff, more and more, I think that more and more you'll, you'll, you'll find does it, will, will it be able to satisfy and actually serve as a serve to direct people in a meaningful way, the answer is certainly will. Will it ever replace actually sitting down with someone? Um, probably, but you know, I, I hope not. I mean, in the sense that I, I think there's something to be gained. I'm in Vajrayana Buddhism deeply for many, many years and run a, a meditation center for since the 80s. There's, yeah, working with the teacher is essential to that tradition. Is it essential to astrology? Probably not, but it may be preferable. Well, uh, from my conceptualization of what's happening from the astrologer is that an astrologer is using the symbols to be able to have a direct connection to a transcendent symbolic realm, and that it's the role of the astrologer to take this eternal, timeless realm and to collapse it into a story or some information that is going to be in direct response to someone's intentions or needs that are arising in the moment. And Jeffrey Cornelius calls that the moment of astrology, that as you're looking at that and listening to that client, that there's something that is to do with human consciousness that is interfacing through the symbolic language of the astrological symbols into a transcendent, non-local field. And I, I am very skeptical that uh, any sort of, even AI is going to be able to do uh, supervised or unsupervised learning to be able to do that type of transcendent type of interface. Well, you have a right to be skeptical, uh, but that's just your opinion. And it, most of what you just said to me is, is amounts to using astrologer as an oracle. Can astrology be an oracle? Absolutely. An oracle is something that puts us in touch, in contact, so that the universe can speak to us in different ways. But I don't think that it's necessarily dependent on another human being. And so I would disagree with you there. Um, I think that a lot of what you described isn't really astrology. It's 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 using astrology in an oracular way. Hmm. So I guess for what what how do you think of or define astrology then? Like what what is astrology? Oh, good. Well, uh, astrology is simply cultural astronomy. So that astrology is not primarily a predictive science because any unless you call the fact that we can make uh, ephemerides that go way into the future very precisely, that's the astronomy of it. Astrologer's job is to take to take the astronomical predictions, which are not predict the predictions just of what and they're hundred percent accurate so far, and tell us what they mean. If you know Mars Saturn conjunction is precisely calculable, but what it means is where we we differ with one another as astrologers and find our differences because I may say something like I'm just saying now, you may say something like you're just saying now. So 
the problem has been there's not enough depth agreement among astrologers as to what this or that means. But look at the state of astrology. Astrology, 400 or so some years ago, Copernicus pointed out to us very clearly that everything does not revolve around us, that we revolve around the sun. And the astronomers, the astrologers of the time split. The astronomers walked away with two charts, a geocentric and a heliocentric. But the astrologers clung to the geo chart and have yet to recognize and be empowered by uh, the heliocentric chart. And I think that astronomy and botany are the two oldest academic disciplines. Astronomers make a good living and are well respected. Astrologers make a marginal living and are not well respected. It's not a right livelihood in America at any rate. It is in, I spent, I also wrote, write books, big book, know a lot about Tibetan astrology, Chinese astrology, Vedic astrology. In other countries, it is respected. And they, they're providing something to the community that they need. What I hear from folks here is that we're not respected, we're not respected as astrolog astrologers, but it's, it's the public's fault. Somehow they're not appreciating us. I think it's our fault. They're not providing what it is that could be appreciated. Hmm. This is, you know, you're looking for opinions, right? I have one. <laughs> well, I have an article in The Ascendant uh, talking about uh, astrology, and 20, what t astrology is going to look like in 2025 with VR and AI. I've done over 100 interviews with artificial intelligence experts and huh? over 900 interviews with VR experts. Yeah. And what I see is that we're moving from the information age to the experiential age. Well, and the that's challenge. True. Well, that's it. well, well there, there are three different levels. There's conceptualization and understanding that leads to actual experience, is what you're pointing out. But there's a more important level yet, which is experiences go up and down. We can have an experience one day of quite a bit of vision, and two weeks later we, we don't have it. But realization, when we realize something like turning on a light switch, but realizing the nature of your mind is something different, that never vanishes that remains with us because it's not it, it, it's a, it's a realization rather than experience so you'd have to differentiate between experience which you're pointing at and and realization we, we certainly haven't reached the age of realization well after doing uh over 900 interviews with uh, VR uh, experts and looking at uh, these different experiences, uh -huh. you can translate the elements into different qualities of presence. So you have the fire element being active presence, the air element being mental and social presence, the water element being emotional presence, and the earth element being embodied presence. So astrology is talking elementally about the quality of experience. And so when you talk about qualities, it becomes difficult to start to quantify it into numbers or to, to collapse the, the infinite potential of a wave. It's, that, it's a complementary principle of, of the quantum wave function, which has this duality that is happening at the same time between the wave of potential and the discrete particle. And I think whenever you're writing algorithms with computers uh, today, it's, it has to collapse that wave function into a discrete particle. And that um, when you talk about the multivalent nature of archetypes, it takes an astrologer to be able to look at those many facets of an archetype and then listen to the context of the situation and the experience and the intention that is being arising. And there's a part of that dialogue Electric that happens between two human beings that is an interactive dialogue that I think is very difficult to try to reduce down to algorithm, even with AI. It's, it, it's hard to let go of our attachments, mm -hmm. the things we are attached to, which prevent us from learning anything new. So the way that uh, I look at it, which is pretty much the way that the Tibetan Buddhists look at it, and, and the way that it's explained in the teachings, is that Astrology is one of the limbs of, of the yoga, but it's not the root. Astrology is a, a dualistic discipline. Uh, it, it, I can give you like a, me, a metaphor, an image, or an analogy that if we had like a, a sphere, and that sphere was covered with water and some wind and blowing around, we had one little sailboat on it, astrology could help us. If we would set the sails differently, we would go different places on the sphere. And we can use astrology to go from here to there in our life, often from a, a more troubled time or place to a place where we feel better. But we we'll never would leave the sphere. And the sphere of astrology belongs to what's called samsara. 
that samsara, no amount of astrology will ever lead to realization. It can only, it can help us to improve our lives, right? But it's like a little bit like, and I don't mean to be snide, but it's a little bit like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. No amount of comfort is going to sol solve our death and what happens to us after death and stuff like that. Only some, only realization of the actual nature of, of what we're doing could do that. Astrology doesn't allow that. That's not, that's not its function. So I think that no matter how many words you use, and you just used a lot, um, you, it boils down to that astrology is a dualistic science, or not science, uh, for making, for improving our life. But I, I, I disagree with you. I think that it will be able to be done pretty darn well in the future computers. Mm. But I'm not saying not to use people, but someone like myself can't be everywhere, and I can't talk to everyone, but eventually, but if I write a really good book, it, it brings it down to earth, it makes sense. I mean, the whole idea of words is that either they make sense or they're nonsense. They make sense. Sense is always an experience that we have to have. So all words point. They're pointers at experience. And just Shakespeare said that best of all, you know, to be or not to be. Once we have the experience, that's the next step, which I think I, I heard you talking about. But that's not the same as realizing our experience. So I don't know whether you can understand that. But. Well, I guess when I talk to astrologers, I get that But astrology. I don't care how many... You, you talk in numbers of them. You talk to 900 this and 900 that. It means nothing. You, you know, that, may, that doesn't create a majority opinion except just superficially. That I can disagree with that and not be wrong just because you have numbers that you present against me. So it, it's well, foolish. I think the open question is, like, what is the nature of consciousness? Like, what is consciousness? Well, you tell me. I mean, consciousness is so many things, so I, I, I don't know what you even imagine. But what well, do you I think imagine? that astrology, to some extent, is a map of consciousness, where the houses represent the, the domains of human experience that are context. The, oh, I get it. The, okay. the, the elements are a quality of experience. Okay. The planets are the character, I the aspects are the don't, personal don't dynamics, and the, as and the transits are kind of like the character development. So I see spare, astrology spare me as... Spare all that. So, okay, the way you're using it, yes? that consciousness, but it's a consciousness that is unrealized. How to realize that consciousness isn't the same as having a consciousness. So that's my answer to that. I think there's also different maps from Tibetans and other Buddhists. Well, that you maps have, you are obviously, like you have a, your agenda is obscuring the reality of the situation. What's my agenda? Your agenda is just your prejudice. You have a prejudice toward what you want, what you feel is you believe, right? No, I'm not actually really trying to understand what you're saying. You know, well, and there's certain degrees that I disagree. So. Well, no, but you can disagree. But uh, all I can do is present what I have. Right? I can't. Better than that, I can't do. So I'm just telling you as best I can that, to my to my reckoning, you're you're um, yeah, you're obscuring what you're trying to get at. I mean, you're not, your mind isn't open. I think that I disagree that there's a myth of the individual, and you say that you did everything by yourself, but if you look at genius oh, who comes up back with to like that again, algorithms, so. and I think that there's a community of like even the zodiac and the signs that comes from a cultural heritage of, our, of the history of Western thought. But you, so, you, see, that's what I'm saying. You're clinging to that when I explain it clearly. You, you haven't even read in my, any of my books or know any of my techniques. But I don't yet, believe that any one person could invent everything in astrology. I think it comes but, from a community. It's like both yang and yin. It's like it's it's uh, like the, I think there's a collaboration that's happened over many millennia. But I, I can't keep repeating it. I didn't say that I didn't learn that I didn't participate in it. I, I have part participated in the the whole you know line of astrology. I'm saying that the specific techniques that I introduced to astrology weren't there before. Not that I didn't use aspects and houses and stuff like that. I'm saying that, and you don't even know, you don't even know what local space is. So, which everyone here would tell you what it is. So, I'm just saying you need to do some research, then come back and talk to me. And I'm not saying that I did everything alone. I'm saying my techniques did not exist before. 
almost all of the techniques that I've documented came out of my mind and were not there in the history of astrology before. But wasn't there equations from like... Sure, no, but like, to, to you're going back to the function. Of course there were I'm not saying I invented planetary equations, right, or anything like that. I, I, I use astrology to try to bring out what I see in the mind, and I'm skilled at that. And you're trying to say that I'm not using the nuts and bolts or something like that. I'm saying I am using the nuts and bolts, but what I brought to astrology wasn't there before. And I think that if you would, I could show you, you know, a few books that you could go look at, even while you're here. You can download them and see that these ideas weren't there before. It's not like I wrote a book on retrogrades. It's not that retrogrades were not there before that we didn't write books about them that this particular way of looking at them was not there before hmm. right so that's all i'm saying you're trying to make me into trying to be like a singleton or singularity or something i'm not saying that i'm saying that i've been introduced to astrology not to brag but that it's the truth and you can verify it for yourself that stuff that other people have never done like um, like looking at the uh, heliocentric modal system of the planets in a book I wrote called Interface. No one ever did that before, much less interpreted. Or local space. No one ever looked at azimuth and altitude and came up with a story of how it worked and what it means. So I did this over and over and over again. It's just a fact. It's not just bragging. It's like, that's what, that's what I've done. And it would be good if you did some homework and, f and took a look at it and then came back and talked to me and then you, you'll find that I'm telling the truth. It's not true because I'm telling it to you, it's, I'm telling it to you because it's the way it is for me. It's mm -hmm. the truth. Okay, well I, I believe that uh, astrologers are always going to be a part of astrology and that it's going to be impossible for computers to ever uh, figure out a way to directly no, no, interface with the symbolic realm. Right, I'm just saying that that's one of your prejudices. But I, I respect you for having that opinion, but I don't necessarily agree with that. That's okay. All. Okay. Well, there's, yeah. we have we can agree to disagree on certain we issues. We can. We'll find our differences, right? But yeah. our differences don't make us unfriendly. Our di differences just are what they are. I mean, I hear you. I just don't. I'm not so sure about that because right. I've programmed enough astrology and an enormous amount of interpretation. Both, you know, did I give you a card and stuff? I can't remember. But you should get one, and you know, let me just go through. Since this is stuff that you, you seem to be stuck on, uh, you know, so, you no, know, this is a fun interview. I like this. Let's just go through. Here's another one. I've written two books on solar activity. I'm not the only one to do it. Ranchai did it. Who is one of my people that I most, most respect, and the only astrologer that I ever really learned from. Astrologers are not aware of the importance of the solar activity for us on a daily basis. So those are books I wrote. Um, here's a book on visions that occur in eclipses. Some of that material has never been done before. So I have many, many books. I have a number of books on comparing the heliocentric to the geocentric and how that works in terms of archetypes. Never been done before. Um, here's a book. Called astrology of the heart that is um, a different view on initiation in the Saturn cycle. Never been, no one's ever looked at it that way, and an interpretation of outer planets that nobody has ever done before. And we could talk about any of these things. Then you can. Here's one called burn rate, which I think I mentioned. That is just uh, a different way of using retrogrades that has been ever been done. I was the first person to like. Here's a book called Astrology of Space in 1976. I was the first person to write a book that took all of this deep space objects, quasars, pulsars, um, and, and reduced them to an astrological notation with all the diagrams of how the local group of systems, the local group of galaxies, where everything was. No one had ever done that before. So when I say that I'm doing stuff that wasn't done before, here's a book, 800-page book on Tibetan astrology. I'm not the only one that has written about, but 
I'm one of the only ones. Mm. Yeah, so well, what do you see as the connection between Western astrology, Tibetan astrology, Chinese astrology, and Indian astrology? Is there some sort of unifying thing that you see is common in all the different different types of astrology you study? Yeah, I think that I talked about it before. It's a dualistic, samsaric uh, way of benefiting people. But often, other cultures don't just it's, it's we here in America I and mean, in the West that are so concerned about the self and the soul and it, in, in Tibet or India or, or China, it's much more pragmatic than that. They're more interested in answering questions like how many kids they're going to have or will they make a lot of money. It's only here in the West that I seem to find, and you know, like if you try to talk about the self to Tibetans, and I've been to Tibet a number of times, um, they just don't, you know, they're just not they're just not worried about the self. So this is not a question that comes up. And it's only here that we're just anguish so much about all our feelings and stuff like that. Not that it, I'm just, I mean, I do the two. You know, I'm Western. But I was surprised not to find it in other cultures so much. It's there, but they're not all, it, all worried about themselves, right? Mm. I don't know why. Mm. And, uh, and finally, what do you think is the ultimate potential of astrology and what it might be able to enable? Well, I, I think I mentioned it twice. Um, the ultimate potential of astrology is to, ben is to benefit, to help make our lives, the lives that we're living in, in samsara, that means in this world, uh, the cyclic world of existence, existence that we're in, to make it more, us more comfortable, more meaningful, and more useful. But uh, it, it's not a form of realization. You know, Buddhism is a form of realization, and there are other kinds of realization. But so I think that's the potential of astrology is wonderful, but it's limited. Hmm. So, and is there anything else that's left unsaid that you'd uh, like to say? Well, not really. I mean, uh, I would like you to look into some of these things that that I said about the techniques that I developed and, and read about them a bit and then uh, talk to me about them or email me about them or something. Okay. You know, okay. Great. Well, thank you for sitting down and uh, telling me about your history. And I know we had a little bit of uh, uh, disagreements on different things, but I'm, I'm glad to, to have the conversation and to, to at least uh, uh, hear your perspective and I'll, I'll definitely look into different stuff here at some point. Well, I, yeah, I think we had some mostly semantic differences. But those semantic differences is fun to, are fun to iron out. That I think that if we would get down to the nitty gritty, we'd have a lot of fun. And if it was a little bumpy, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's just uh, just the way the world works. It's a good example of uh, how it is in samsara, right? This is uh, <laughs> we don't always agree. And but you're coming a long way to talk to me. I, mean, I don't mean a long way time-wise. I'm saying. From where you are and from where I am in the history of astrology is a big distance. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot you don't know. And I'm not putting you down for it, I'm saying... How do you know that? I mean, I, I don't know local space, but I know... I've talked to over 250 inter, uh, astrologers I, I and I've you. done a lot of I know experience. So, you know, it's like... it's. I mean, I'm not trying to throw it, but you were throwing numbers at me. So it's like, I, I, this is sort of a weird situation because you were also doing that. So maybe we're reflecting each other in what, some way. What were the numbers I was throwing at you? What? How many, like, how, like you did the best and the most ever... You didn't uh, like that. Posters that and that goes stuff. against your grade. What's that? That goes against your grain? Well, I think that, no, I mean, I'm sort of matching you in that way, so I'm just reflecting you. No, you're, you're matching me with numbers. What I was trying to, to stick up for myself was I didn't go along with your uh, trying to subsume me into not even looking at my work or knowing about my work. But I'm saying, I'm not saying you don't know any astrology. I'm saying that um, you're not able to hear me very well. Maybe I'm not able to hear you very well. Well, one question that I'll just ask it one more time just to see, because I asked originally, when you first got it started in astrology, what astrology books and what information did you use to learn astrology? And you said you didn't learn anything from anyone else. No, no. How could I have the largest astrology library in the world and not have seen any astrology books? So who did you, who did you learn astrology from? Here we go again. Uh, I read, you know, Mark Edmund Jones. I read Dane Rudyard, Alan Leo, and scores of them. 
what I'm trying to say is not that I didn't read them or didn't appreciate them or even love some of them. It's that I didn't learn what I ended up doing in astrology from them. But you needed those those people. You didn't mention them originally, and I was trying to get who you learned from. Well, it's a short interview. And that's, interview. And that's okay. I, but you're putting words. I didn't learn from them. That's what I'm saying. I learned. If you mean learning, meaning get a sense of what everyone's doing. Of course I did. But I didn't learn any astrology from them, uh, other than pretty mundane, routine kind of stuff, which I appreciated. Like I could appreciate Dane Rudyard. He came to my home. We. We, we knew each other. John Addy, do you know who John Addy is? Well, see, this is, he's a great thinker that uh, introduced harmonic theory to astrology. James Williamson, a brilliant mathematician. Uh, many, many astrologers that uh, I know. It's not that I didn't learn from them uh, that we didn't exchange. It's that the things that I eventually contributed to astrology, which are the things I contributed, didn't come from, uh, with one exception, I think Grant, Grant Louis, you know who Grant Louis is. Well, then this is ignorance on your part. It's Grant Louis. Wait, wait, wait. It's, hold on. It's that, ignorance. That's not, like, it's it's ignorance. okay to not know things. There's a lot of things that you don't know. So no, why are you trying to shame me because I don't know things? That's like, that's really shitty. No, I, no it, but you are. You're like shaming me for not knowing things. I'm asking questions. I'm have an open mind, and you. Every time I say that I don't know something, you shame me for no, not knowing it. Not That's, it makes me feel really bad and angry. Well, like you did that a lot. I said you're ignorant. Yeah, that's it, not a nice thing to say. It, it's a true thing to say. Ignor Why? Ignorance it's a, is not you're, anything to be. You're arrogant. Well, according to you. Well, in, in your I'm eyes. ignorant. According to, so, like here you are insulting me and shaming me, no. and it's just like it's shitty. No, it's here you are being insulted. I'm not insulting you. You're calling me ignorant. What is that? It's not empathy. That's not a heart connection. That's saying I'm better than you. No, it's try try looking up ignorance in the dictionary. It's not knowing information. It's okay to not know information. That's what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not holding it against you for not knowing it. I'm just saying you're ignorant of it. You're calling me. I, I, there's a there's a difference of, of being and a, a difference of, of like you're saying that I, there's a character flaw of me no, being you, ignorant. No, these are your words. You, you're putting. I said you were ignorant of stuff that you should not be ignorant in and being in, interviewing people. You should know some of this stuff. I, I, I don't know the history. That's why I asked you. I asked who you learned from because I was trying to learn. And then what you told me was that you didn't learn from anybody. That's what you told me. No, I wanted to learn this history. I, I actually that's, really that's respect what, that you've been in this astrologer so long. I'm, I'm hungry to hear like what it was like back then and who you learned from. And, and every time I did that, you said I did it all by myself. And, that, and I didn't like that answer because I actually wanted to hear what it was like to be a part of the astrology community. That's why I was so angry because I wanted to hear about your experience in the astrology community. But what I'm saying is that you... The things that you wanted to hear, I feel, are an impediment to actually hearing. That I'm not giving you the things you wanted to hear, I'm giving you the things I have to say. Right? I'm, I'm not catering myself to you, I'm doing my best to, to be kind to you and to be understanding, but you, from my point of view, you have very, very clear, definite expectations that I don't agree with, right? That I find them holding holding us apart and not bringing us together. The things that you, you're looking for, answers for, I see what you're looking for and I don't want to give you that answer because I think that answer is not going to be useful to you. But that's what I, it's like I ask a question and you, you say that that's not important so I'm going to answer the question that I wanted to answer which is what I did, not what the community did. That's what happened. I said, what did the community do for you? And you said, the community did nothing for me, I did everything. No, but see, you, you put a completely different accent on it. What I, I also said quite a bit about being part of the community, being loved by the community, in the community, having friends, and I've done all the things that we would do. If you're talking about my astrology, it's, it, it didn't come from the community. The things that most of the, I mean, some of it did, but some of the things didn't, like Tibetan astrology, there wasn't any. Well, was mathematics invented or discovered? So this is the question is yeah, whether or not you discovered it or invented it. No, but. I tried to tell you as best I could that the mathematics and things like that, of course I used what mathematics is already there. Well, as a mathematical object, is it invented or discovered? 
what's an app? What do you mean mathematical object? So is there an eternal realm of ideal forms that you somehow interface into a discovery process, or is it a, a creation of the human mind? Everything comes from the human mind. Okay. Everything, okay. Everything comes, every thought, word, and deed, discovery, and invention comes out of the mind. I, you say human mind, I'm saying the mind itself. Human like mind. The, 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 the universal mind or the human mind? See, but don't you see that these kinds of, of distinctions are separative? That I would then have to ask you, what's the human mind and what's the universal mind? And I just find that not something worth doing. In, a, in the philosophy of math, there's two approaches. The Platonists believe that I'm not a Platonist. Uh, that, uh, that that uh, mathematics is uh, discovered. That there's an ideal form of archetypal form, and that you have a process by which you have a, an epistemology by which you are interfacing with that ideal form, and you discover it and bring it into concrete reality. A naturalist who doesn't believe in the transcendent realm would say that um, everything is a semantic description of what reality is, and that um, there is no transcendent realm, and that it's it, all these mathematics objects are invented by the human mind. So there's a there's a fundamental difference in the philosophy of math as to whether or not mathematical objects are invented or discovered. And, th and I think that from what I'm hearing, you're saying that you believe that they're invented by the human mind and, and not discovered. You, I just find that you're trying to put me in a box. Well, I'm just I mean, asking, like, I don't, what do you think? I, I don't know the answer to it in the sense that I don't think of it that way. Uh, and, and you're trying to say, I have to think about it this way or that way. Well, I, I, what I'm saying is that when you say that you invented it, it could be that you discovered it. Like, you didn't oh, invent it, that you discovered something that was already there in the transcendent realm, but that never existed in this concrete reality, so this, but you were the medium of it, rather than something that came from your mind. What I'm trying to say, I don't necessarily you know, fit into your way of putting it. Uh, I'm saying that I learned to use my mind To use my mind to, maybe you want to use the word discover or or invent or whatever combination of that is, all of the things that I know of came from within my mind or within the mind. And in Tibetan tradition, and especially in astrology, there's a tradition of what are called terma. Terma are also called mind treasures. There are things that are that have been placed in the mind that people like you and I with enough practice and stuff can go in and if you want to use, I'm not sure what, whatever word you want to use, not, not invent but discover and we can uh, recognize them enough to experience them for a while until we can formulate them and then share them with others and that, that's what I do and I'm a naturalist, I came from, if that maybe, I don't know I never got out of high school. I don't know much about math. It was my worst subject. So um, the math that I learned in order to program stuff, I just did by sheer will because I wanted the result of being able to experiment with different kinds of astrology. But I'm not a, a, a pundit or a pandit. I'm not a scholar. Uh, but do you believe in like a transcendent realm beyond space-time? This, I mean, to me, no offense, this is where you're going to get hurt. This is ridiculous to me. I don't know how to answer that. It's so cerebral. Well, that's because it's, it's, this is the philosophical difference. You're a naturalist who doesn't believe in the transcendent realm. No, don't I'm tell me what I don't believe. in the transcendent realm okay. where, where things are discovered rather than invented. Okay, so as a naturalist, you're saying, I invented it? And I said, no, you discovered it. No, no, let's remove the word invented. You're having too much trouble with it. And, and I don't mean it that way. Well, this is the, from the philosophy of math. Naturalists believe that objects, uh, that mathematical objects, are invented. That's that's, well, a, I don't that's, that a, that's from the philosophy of math. Okay, but I don't know the philosophy of math. Well, that's why we have a disagreement. I'm ignorant of it. That's why we're disagree. That's why we're in disagreement here because, oh, well, then, like, there's a fundamental philosophical difference that we have. That I believe in a Platonic eternal realm beyond space and time, a non-local, non-spatial temporal realm in which there's a timeless realm of eternal archetypes and that human beings use the symbolic language of mathematics as well as the archetypes in order to interface that to discover things. They don't invent them. So when you say that you invented all this, I said, no, no you're, it's like discovery. So it's a, it's a philosophy. You don't realize that you're being very aggressive. I've asked you now at least twice, stop using the word invent with me. Maybe it's, a, it's, from a, it's not something, it's something that's it, it's, it's pointing to a fundamental philosophical difference that is underlying the entire conversation we've been having. 
it's, okay. it's the fundamental. It's is, a philosophical is, is, is it okay for us to fundamentally disagree? Yeah, there is. Yeah. Yeah, but it's sort of your, your, it's as a naturalistic perspective to say that there's no transcendent realm beyond space time, and so that. But I never said that. I just said I don't know whether there is or not. But you, you turning it into I have to either be in this camp or that camp. Well, that's I'm asking you if you believe it or not. I don't. What I'm saying is I can't. Just like I had to take algebra one three times, I can't make sense of it. Of what you're saying, I don't get it. Okay, that's fair. Is it fair? Yeah, but I don't get it. Otherwise, I would tell you the truth, right? I would do my best. I think we both found different points in which, in this conversation, we've been ignorant of different things, and that's okay. But I, I'm not afraid of being ignorant. But I'm not either. If I'm ignorant, I'll, I'll be glad, you know, I want to learn, right? And I do learn. So, and I certainly never meant to insult you. Not what I was trying to do. But I was trying to not be pigeonholed also. Okay. Okay, well, I think we should uh, leave it there yeah, and just uh, sure. and, and, and just thank you again for, for joining me today. And uh, yeah, so thank you. You're welcome.